Hey, hey, everybody, let me know you can hear me and whether I'm too loud again. I'm just making sure that we are live in all the right places, and then we're going to get talking. I know Ray's got some important things to discuss, and we've got a lot of stuff about feeding to go over. Okay, looks like I'm live on. Everybody with us, uh, remember, just mute yourself if you're not talking. Okay, we are live on YouTube. We are, I believe, live on Facebook. So, holler, holler. Yep, we are. Okay, just making sure. And I'm watching chat from everywhere, guys. So, if, you, if you're watching with us, you can, of course, comment, and I'll eventually see it. <laughs> um, okay. Welcome, everyone. Happy Wine Wednesday. Um, I hope your week has been fabulous. I hope your seahorses are great. We've got a great discussion that we're going to have in just a second after I say hello to everyone. But I did want to mention to you guys that we're making some changes. Uh, you're going to see some videos coming out soon. And I never say this, but if you want, if you like what you see, if we have a speaker or a topic that you really like, um, there is always an option to super chat or um, there's a sticker option that Cindy Coral Gal uses all the time. And so I just... You know, I never say it, but if you want to support us, absolutely, there are ways to do it. Let me know if you need to know more. I don't want to ramble. Anyhow, okay, welcome everyone that's here with me so far. How was your week? Good. See, I, I was going to say, I get in trouble for telling people to mute themselves because then it's like, all right. It's a lot of mute. Um, okay, well, we're, the topic today is we're going to do, Tammy talked about um, frozen foods, so did Felicia, at the Seahorse and Pipefish MACNA 2020 online event. Um, and she did a great job. The video's out there. Make sure you watch it. I'll try to link it when we're done. Um, but after her speech in the question, question and answer portion, there were a lot of really good questions that I wasn't able to get into the video. Um, and there's just a lot of information. I, I just thought we'd do a deep dive into some of the questions that I posted uh, when I told you about this event. So um, anyhow, before we get to that though, Ray, would you please share what's going on with you, sir? Well, I had, uh, I have the runt uh, Barbary female that uh, is the most active seahorse I've ever had. And uh, a few days ago, I noticed uh, she wasn't moving around the tank. And this was something sudden. The day before, I had noticed not, or I didn't notice anything like that at all. And uh, after about three days, I noticed she was getting a little bit thinner. So I start watching a little bit more to see if she's eating. And she was eating, but uh, she was being awful selective in what she ate. Um, and that wasn't normal for her. And then the next day, I get up, and the old poster is swollen and uh, sticking out to beat hell. And, that's something that uh, I've not come across in my 18 years. So I have no idea what to do. So the, you said the ovipositor is, is like st sticking out? like. Yeah. Dan's okay. Facebook page, uh, there's two pictures of it there. Okay. Maybe we can try to pull that up. I'll try to pull that up in a second so we can look at it. Um, any thoughts, Dan, about that? Because I, 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 you got me. I'm clueless. I've never seen that. Well, I don't have quite enough to go on, but the ovipause are sticking out. Is she kind of fat in the stomach? No. You know, I was questioning the possibility of being egg bound. Um, yeah, she's, she's never ever had eggs. That doesn't mean That's that. Been that no well over four years, but she is so skinny now compared to what she normally is. And this is, I think, five days now since uh, I first noticed her uh, lack of uh, swimming around. And uh, uh, just a couple days with the, uh, how do you pronounce it? Over, over, positive. over positive, yeah. It, it, the only thing that's coming to my head, I'm wait, I am sure Dan's looking it up to, to see a little better, but. Um, if, if stuff's sticking out and she's thin, yeah, that really confuses me because, like, my first thought would be, um, you know, some sort of internal 
GBD type situation, pushing, you know, bloating, but she's not bloated. So that's definitely not it. <laughs> Is that the mouth. ovipositor yeah. or the anus that's protruding? Uh, I think it's the ovipositor. Yeah, I've seen prolapse pouches and stuff, but I've never seen a female have that issue. And I'm I'm totally paying attention. I was trying to shoot Tammy the the link. <laughs> Dang it. Um. Anyways, are you pulling it up, Dan, or no? No, I'm I'm trying to look at it. Um, I'm blowing it up. While he looks, uh, it's not quite as swollen at the moment. What are you, are you doing? Anything at all, Ray? No, um, I I have the only medications I have anymore is, um, yeah, the gas one. Yeah, is, is she eating? That's, is she what? Is she eating? A little, not not normal, but she is taking some. Yeah, I'm not convinced that that's a bacterial thing, which, you know, if it's not bacterial or parasitic, you're really limited because you've got something else going on. And that's not something that we can really fix. You know? Such a shame. And for anybody who's watching who just jumped in um, on Seahorse Sources group, uh, that's what we're discussing is Ray's post. Where his seahorse, female seahorse, is having some issues. Hey, um, Salty Reed. Let's see. Let me go to. While you're looking, Nicole, Marina, anybody? Oh, nope. I guess you're showing us something, Dan. There we go. All right, hey guys. All right, hang on. Let me make you big. Um, okay, well, I, all right, we'll just do it these way. Here we go. Oh, wow. Yeah. Poor thing. I'd say it's about half that size right at this moment now. Well, that's that's a positive sign. Um, yeah. Well, it changes. It, it will uh, it'll get bigger and then it goes down again. In in uh, a day's time, I've seen it uh, twice get up like that and then go away. But uh, yesterday it was um, yeah. Yesterday it was uh, swollen all the time. So I guess okay. you could say that's an improvement. Where uh, I've seen it uh, a few times today where it was minimal. Well, this is the second time now. Yeah, it looks like she is getting thin. What are you feeding her? Mysis. Bakari mysis. I don't know. I, you know, I don't see this as something to necessarily treat with antibiotics. It, I, I suppose it could be some type of an internal infection, but... Um, do you have any antibiotics on hand? No, nothing. The only thing I've got left now is that uh, bio bandage. I tried to order uh, um, some Furan 2 and some Trisulfa back, uh, oh, I forget just how long ago it was now, but um, it wasn't uh, sourced in Canada. And when it uh, got to the border, they confiscated it and then let me know. Yeah. If anyone watching this later has had has has seen this or had this happen, definitely go to Seahorse Sources Group and um, comment. I, I I just don't know what to tell you, Ray. This is not something I've actually seen before. It, you know, I've seen where they've become egg bound, it gets swollen, turns red. Yeah. Um, I've seen prolapsed anus before. Um, if you could, if there was. You know, if this was, I'd almost want to put her in a hospital tank and see if she's pooping, because it, it, to me, it looks like there might be some type of blockage. Yeah. 
And and that's an educated guess. That's by no means, you know, am I trying to say I know what's going on because I don't. When you stump Dan, that's really bad. <laughs> isn't, isn't the anus uh, behind the depositor, over depositor? Yeah, it should be uh, underneath it. Yeah. But this, uh, um, this is right at the very front of the, the belly. Yeah, I, I wish I could offer you something, but I really can't. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try to I'll I'll try to do some research too after afterwards. Man, please keep us updated and let us know. Yeah. For sure. Such a shame. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna well. Uh, I, I don't. I wish I could do more than say I'm sorry and please keep us updated. But that's... at least it's, uh, you know, the fact that uh, twice today I've seen it down like this right now. Um, that's a hopeful sign. Absolutely. I kind of liked Dan's idea about you know if you're if you're able like a very simple hospital tank just see if oh, she's. I have no problem hospital tanks. Yeah. See if she's pooing. See if maybe just really fresh you know good water. Hey, we talked last week about sometimes seahorses just get better because they get. Well, I you just know. changed ninety-five percent of this water too. Well, that there you go. Well, again, I really am sorry to hear that. Wish we could do more. Please keep us updated. Um, well, before we get in, and, and thank you for sharing. I wish we had more to, to say or help. Um, before we get into the topic of frozen feeds, Nicole, Marina, anything new with you guys? Anything you wanted to share? No, not too much on my end. <laughs> still, still, baby's doing good. Yeah, they are. The second batch didn't go as great as the first batch, but um, well, they, I still have four out of ten, but and they're about a week and a half. But I'm sorry, my son's playing video games. It's okay. <laughs> you can hear him. Um, but um, no, I mean they're okay, and the little man is pregnant again. My large female actually transferred eggs to him so much. I. Kelly, you saw the video. I did. So, so, so many eggs that he like couldn't even contain them all. He already looks bigger at like three days pregnant than he did both times he delivered before. Mm. And the only reason she gave him the eggs is because my large male was still in a hospital tank being treated with Diamox, but he's back in the main tank and doing much better. Oh, good. So, yeah. So, so the Diamox no, did work? Know. Sorry. It did. Yep. It did. It helped a lot. So, I'm so glad. Me too. <laughs> and I'm, a lot of worrying. <laughs> and when I when I saw your video, I was really wanting to ask Dan it because you know I I don't have experiences with the minis. Um, so is that is that did that surprise you, Dan? Yeah. That her what happened was the a regular size female gave the eggs to the mini, and he, there was just so many, and he's little, so he couldn't even take them all. Was is that? That doesn't, surprise, okay. that doesn't surprise me, but he probably got some. The minis are reproducing. It's not that they can't. Oh, yeah. They just can't hold as much. Yeah, he's had. He's the only one of my males that's had any of the fry so far, but it's usually him and the mini female that, you know, have had fry in the past. So I'm, I'm just curious. And you know what? He's actually quite a bit bigger than he was when I got him. He's probably about the same size as my large female, maybe just a little smidge smaller. The mini female is still teeny tiny, but um, obviously he's not nearly as large as my regular male erectus, but he's not too much smaller than the, you know, the, the large that, female. That, that's a growth spurt to uh, enable, to in that, I can't even spit it out. Um, <laughs> he's trying to catch up so he can be a breeder. Um, he can be the big guy. <laughs> yep. Well, a lot of times when you put... Uh, a small male with bigger females, they'll go through a growth spurt where they can catch up and try to propagate. No, he's still adorable. And he's actually, he's like the funniest. He's like the most lively seahorse. He's dancing nonstop all around the tank, around all of them. So, no, he's awesome. I'm just, I'm wondering now, like, well, now that it's the big female, the large female that transferred her eggs, I'm wondering if he'll maybe potentially have a larger you know, batch of fry since the, you know, I've only had 
16, and then my last one, I guess, would technically be 14, but the first four that were born were born at least three days before the others, and they just didn't look right. So I'm thinking, like, he gave, you know, had a few premature, yep. and then the rest, the, the rest of them, which was only 10, were born, like, three or four days later. So... Um, I'm just wonder, I'm wondering, he may have more, I don't know, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> well, to, normally they will have more each batch up to a point. And right. um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he has a significant amount more. Yeah, me either. And I'm curious too, because my larger Erectus seahorses are the silver saddled. I'm wondering if they'll pick up any of that also. It's just, you know, just gonna be a different brood. This is the first time my, my big female has had any, so. When you say silver saddle, you talking about the markings? Yeah. No, the the markings no. are not permanent. Those are like color. They can. Okay. They're all capable of doing that. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Thank you. Well, I still can't wait to see them, and and definitely want you to keep Me us updated. <laughs> Me either, and I'm just like, please, I just want to be more successful with each batch because it, it's awful. But I'm still new. I've only had two batches, and they've both been very unexpected. So. We'll see. We'll see how this one goes. I know he's due. 14 days will be October 5th. So at least now I know when to watch. <laughs> like sure. nonstop. And and I'm making a prediction right now. Like within a month or two, maybe, Nicole's going to be on here saying, you guys, my house is full of babies. I can't get rid They're everywhere. <laughs> She's, you're going to be successful. I, honestly, <laughs> I know. And I just, I just started pulling my 36, uh, my 40 gallon tank down. Because I'm like, well, what am I going to do with it? And I'm like, I'm not kidding. My husband's like, just sell it. I'm like, I don't want to because I'm going to really need it. <laughs> so, no, yeah, don't I'm sell not it. Getting rid of it yet. I'm <laughs> just going to, it's going to go into storage for a minute. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> I'm right through with you. Um, <laughs> and and you, uh, last question for you. I know we got to get going. Um, but you, did, weren't you setting up a new bigger tank? Was that, am I mixing yes, people yeah, up? Yes, yeah, I have my, okay. se my 75 gallon is all set up. All the seahorses are in it, but it's got, the tw I think the sump is, it didn't say, but I think it's a 20 gallon sump, but it, it's, you know, it's got probably 15 gallons of water in it. What a world of difference. Like, just unbelievable. Yeah. I'm so happy with it. They're happy. Every, you know what I mean? Even my husband who was like, meh, whatever. You know what I mean? With my, my hobby, he just is like, yeah, he could take it or leave it. He likes to see horses, but whatever. Even he's sitting there watching now. He's like, hey. <laughs> Yep, and I'm That's so good. I'm so pro sump. Sumps are amazing. They do make all the difference. You know, you don't have to have them for sure, but man, I agree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's no other way to go. And I just my only regret is that I didn't listen to what everybody told me at the beginning was go as big as you can, as quick as you can. I just wish I had done that from the start. But it's hard to do. Here we are. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> Very good. I'm so glad to hear. And Miss Marina, anything new with you? Nothing too new. Everything's sort of just the same as last week. I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to remember. Everything's okay, though, right? Because I know there was... Okay. Yeah, well, for now. I had um, a few weeks ago, um, sort of over the span of a week, four out of my five seahorses in um, the display tank died and we couldn't really figure out what happened. But... Um, the one that's left, she's a little, she's a little lonely, so she's just got a mirror for now. But um, yeah, she seems fine, which is really weird. I still don't completely know what happened, but I spoke to Sam a lot about it, and um, most likely some kind of weird bacterial thing. Yeah, I, yeah, Sam is is awesome for helping and. If, if that's what she's thinking, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I don't have, have much to add to that because I know it was weird and wild, and I'm just glad that the one gal is uh, doing well. So just curious, um, I know you're extremely careful. Not I'm probably saying it wrong. You're, you like to do things the right way. And so I'm just curious, are you waiting to add more, or do you not ever plan to add more, or...? Well, the thing is, um, the first two died, and then it was about a week later that the next two died. Right. And so I was sort of waiting, like, I didn't really know what to treat her with because I didn't know what had happened, the one that's left. 
And I was really expecting her to die too, which sounds horrible. No, I get but it. But yeah. four out of five to die so quickly, I assumed there was something that they all had. And, um, yeah, she seems to be fine. The weirdest thing about it was they all seemed to be fine. They were all eating. They were all dancing. Um, the night before... Um, the last two that died died. They actually um, had had fry and danced and courted, and the male got pregnant again. So it was all really weird. Like they just seemed completely fine, and then they were just dead. Um, yeah. So I also sort of want to make sure, of course, um, whatever it is isn't still there because I don't want to put more seahorses in and then they die too. Totally, totally understand. I totally get it. That's what I, f I figured you were doing, and that's kind of what I was hoping you'd say. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, but you please... should wait four, four to six weeks before you add more. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait a while. I just, yeah. It's very, very weird. It is. Um, Dan, you don't have, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it sounds like it's bacterial to me. Which type of bacteria, I don't know, but... Uh, I'd be willing to bet if you necropsied them, you would find bacterial, uh, internal bacterial infections, and these type of things start in the gut and then spread from there, and they can go quite quickly. You can go from where the seahorse is, is acting perfectly normal and laying on the bottom, you know, within a, with typically the next morning. But, uh, um, do, fun, I'm sorry, go ahead, Marina. I was just going to say, would you treat the female that's left or do anything special to the tank to try and get it out of there? Well, as far as treating the female, there's two schools of thought. And there's the group that would say, by all means, move her to a hospital tank and be very aggressive at treating and being prophylactic with it. And then there's the group that says, unless you have symptoms or know what it is that you shouldn't treat. Um, I've the way I would have approached it would have been not to treat, would have taken a wait and see you at risk of losing the animal by doing that. But I don't want to sit there and just keep treating with antibiotics and develop uh, bacteria that's resistant to it. And I would just take the wait and see approach. If she makes it, then odds are she's the strongest of the group. As far as the tank goes, by having less animals in there and less food, you should reduce the bacterial counts that are in there. If you had probiotics, I would suggest using those. I would give the tank a really hard scrub down uh, about once a week, run the thickens out of your protein skimmer, large water changes, and basically just try to get everything as clean as you can in anticipation of being able to add new ones. Thank you, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm still gonna wait a little while, and then when I do get new seahorses, they'll have to get, um, through quarantine before they go in but yeah hopefully she keeps going and is just fine she seems fine but um yeah i guess the other seemed fine too which is the the worry yeah my final santa question life, oh i'm sorry go ahead santa life mike f is supposed to be available in australia i would look around and see if you can get it and if so mm -hmm. i would dose the tank daily um for a period of time until you get the seahorses and even after you get them. Um, if, you, if you're if you able to find it, you're probably gonna have to buy a 500 gram bag and for the size tank you have, that'll probably last you nine months or so. Okay, thank you. And that was called Santa Life? Yeah, it's S-A-N-O-L-I-F-E and then Mike, M-I-C, and it comes to Santa Life Mike or Santa Life Mike dash F. Mike F is not quite as strong, which is easier to dose for your size tank. Uh, F stands for fish. The other type is designed for shrimp farms, but it works in seahorse tanks. Just out of curiosity, um, if if she couldn't get it uh, where she is, and I could get it, would I run into the same situation sending it her to her that Dan has? Is it considered well, a medication? Well, it. The fact that it's already down there would indicate that uh, there's no laws okay. against that type of bacteria, but shipping bacteria across international lines can be tricky. 
Okay, well, just if I can help Marina, mm -hmm. let me know if you need help. But, um, and final question um, for anybody, I keep picking on Dan, but of course you guys, anybody can, can pipe up. Um, but is there, and I'm not trying to make anything worse or scary, I'm just, I'm such, I'm very much like you, Marina, I'm very careful and et cetera. So I totally understood what you just said, Dan, but by not treating, could this final seahorse not be um, an asymptomatic carrier of something, or will the time and the lowered bacterial amounts be enough? To, to well, the, there's a potential for any animal to be an asymptomatic carrier. Right. Um, you, you'll never know that. Um, there's not much you can do about that. Unless, of course, if you have the probiotics, you can, you know, try yeah. to overcome with the probiotics. Um, just because you treat with antibiotics doesn't mean you'll completely eliminate the bacteria either. And I, I liked that you pointed out the, you know, that when we just throw antibiotics in, um, you know, you're you're very likely to end up creating a, a resistant type situation, or you could, you know, if you, anyways. I, great points was my point. Okay, well, Marina. Yes, thank could, you. Yes, and please keep us updated. And, um, it, you know, thank you for coming and, and sharing. Um, okay, guys, well, uh, we, we, we get to chatting and it's, we're, we, we've been going half an hour. <laughs> so let's start the topic, shall we? And let, if you guys have something else you want to bring up, it's totally cool. But um, anyways, all right, now, see, I was all prepared and then I clicked something off and now I'm not prepared. Um, because, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, Tammy did a great job kind of covering the upper level of what's important about frozen foods, why it's important, but I thought we'd just briefly go over that, um, talk about it, ask any questions, and kind of dive deeper into the differences and what matters and so on and so forth. So, we've, we've discussed in even previous Wine Wednesdays that uh, live feeds are better. Um, but many people can't collect live feeds or worry about contamination from where, you know, their, their place in the world that the ocean might not be as clean as others. Um, so, you know, the frozen mysis is the staple diet. Um, but, uh, sorry, I'm trying to read my own notes, guys. I'm not doing a great, great job here. Um, wh why do you guys think that the frozen foods are so important? Why do you think they're unstable? Why do you think it's... So crucial to make sure that they're not um, thawed or discolored or anything like that. Anyone? All right then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is going fantastic. This is why I don't like you trying to use notes, Dan. It's because I always screw it up. Okay. Well, let's start over. Let's just start over. What should you look for in frozen foods to make sure that it is quality, that it is, you know, not spoiled, and et cetera? What are the things that you guys look for when you go buy your fro or order your frozen food? For me, it was a case of finding uh, someone I could depend on that was going to get me the order in every time and not have a problem with it. And uh, so now for the last, let's see, one, two, Last two and a half years, I guess now, the best I can think of at the moment, I've stuck with the same person and I have no more problems. The very first order that he gave me, it was a problem. Uh, some of them were uh, old and uh, discolored and some of them were obviously uh, partially defrosted. But when I explained to him my needs for my seahorses, uh, he guaranteed me next time there'd be no problem, and I haven't had any problems since. Nice. Uh, I can't say that the same as other places that, uh, well, I did have one other place, but um, it meant that my daughter uh, had to uh, pick them up and bring them down to me, and um, she wasn't yeah. always coming this way, and it's uh, an hour and a half drive. Uh, keeping it, yeah, that's, uh, I, I was gonna, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah, you're, that's one of the biggest things that causes the problem is, I mean, we could discuss collect, how they're collected, how they're flash frozen or frozen, but keeping them frozen, like um, shipping, and Tammy, Tammy kind of discussed this a little bit, and whether or not dry ice was the best way to do it, 
and you know how to how to get it from the 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 vendor to the store and to us and keeping it at the right temperature. Dan, I think you've talked before about what what temperature what should the freezer be in order to keep these frozen foods good for. Well, Tammy covered it actually in her video uh, or talk. Um, minus 30 Celsius is generally the accepted norm. Um, there's some that will argue being colder, but if you think about the shipment process, this stuff is coming, Hikari, I believe, is coming from China. So it's coming over by boat, then it arrives to a port, then it's trucked around the country to various distributors who then ship it to various stores. And then in some cases, people will buy it online. But the handling is, you know, it's shipped from overseas, it's shipped to one place, it's shipped again, and sometimes a third or fourth time before you get it. And most of the distributors will have huge walk-in sub-zero freezers. That's usually not where the problem is. Most stores, on the other hand, I mean, when you have these stores where you can walk in and, and look in the freezer and pull it out yourself, they're usually not cold enough. So if they keep it on hand for any period of time, it's usually going to go bad. Um, there's an interesting graph that I found. Um, let me pull it up. Okay. It, um, it covers time and temperature. Um, Oh, where'd it go? There we go. There we go. Whoops. <laughs> there we go. Dan's got all the okay. fancy schmancy equipment. Go ahead, Dan. Sorry. So if you look at the graph, you've got uh, three different colors. You got the blue, you got the yellow, and you got the um uh, whatever you want to call it, I call it pink. Uh, but the blue dotted line is for fatty fish kept at minus 10 C. Minus 10 C is 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, keep in mind, freezing is 32 degrees. So th this is probably on par with the average freezer is. But look at that line compared to the pink dotted line, which is at minus 30, which is it's not quite a full 24 months, but it's a fairly long period of time. But when you go under um, minus 10 Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit, you, you're, you're down there at a month or two and it's already gone bad. It's turning. And that is the biggest problem is people keeping it cold enough. My, my freezer, the coldest I can get, I've got it turned all the way down, it's a chest freezer, is minus 14 uh, Fahrenheit and minus 14 Fahrenheit puts it somewhere about minus 25 Celsius roughly and I could, that's cold enough that if I put ice cream in that freezer you will not eat it until you defrost it you can take a hammer and a chisel to it to try to get it apart um, so it's it really takes a substantially cold temperature to store this stuff long term and in the supply chain if the if the trucks aren't cold enough if uh, they're stuck outside too long. And you'll see it from time to time when you buy as mices. If you look at the packages where you've got, you know, the, the packages are deformed. They're frozen solid, but they're deformed. And that's because they were thawed out and refrozen. And the biggest thing to look for with your packages is color. It should be a light color. As the fats go rancid and uh, oxidation occurs, you'll see them turn brown. And I've I've received mices before that were dark brown, which, you know, it sucked. But one time I threw out a half of a case of uh, Icaria mices for that very reason. Gotcha. So if we if we are in a situation where we, you know, have to use common sense, you know, seeing that the mices is a light color, um, seeing that the package isn't deformed, isn't, you know, obviously isn't brown, um, if we get it in, in good shape which we'll talk about a little further later but if we get it in in good shape but our freezer like mine probably doesn't get cold enough just to be honest I, it probably doesn't I don't I don't have a deep freezer or chest or any of that um, does that merely mean that we shouldn't store it long term or I mean what's what can we do I don't recommend people try to store it long term at home unless they have to 
-hmm. Now, my protocol typically is to keep two weeks worth of food on hand, except during the summertime when we enter hurricane season. I'll extend that out to a month or six weeks um, just in case the, you know, my distributor gets whacked, I'm kind of screwed. Um, but I mean, well, I guess, though, sorry. For the most part, I just don't recommend, you know, there's some people that buy it in bulk and store it and keep six months, 12 months on hand. Right. And unless they've got a super cold freezer, that's not a smart move, unfortunately. Gotcha. But I, the- I keep uh, mine a long time. I'm sorry? I buy 12 one pound packs at a time. And um, a pack will do me, uh, was it uh, six, 16, 16 days. And uh, I keep it in my big 18 cubic foot freezer and uh, um, trying to think 20 minus 28 Fahrenheit is the best that it has and that goes to and that's when the uh, when it's full. If I don't have much in it, for some reason it's only about minus 22. But, my uh, freezers in my fridges, uh, neither one of them uh, get close to that. Well, I guess what I was trying to ask um, was, you know, we're not scientists. I really, I get into the information about the fat, the fatty acids and omega-3 and why all, all of it's important, um, which is probably boring to most people. But so for, for the average person who doesn't really know the timeline for oxidization and blah, 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 is the key just to make sure that it's still light color? Like if I put some quality looking lysis in my freezer, obviously if I check, if I keep it, if I bought a huge package and four weeks later it's it's browning and turning darker, then I might know I have a problem. But for the first few weeks, it should be okay, right? I mean, one would assume. Okay. Um, I mean, that's really the only way you can check. I mean, you, you really can't just send it off to a lab. Well, it's not right. worthwhile sending it off to a lab and having it checked and everything else. By the way, it's interesting when you look at the graph, if you'll notice the solid lines, the solid lines are fish that are not fatty. Um, oh. The, uh, unfortunately, the thing is cutting off my, my bloody um, part of the graph, the information down on the bottom. But the solid lines are lean fish. And if you'll notice on the long-term storage, at, even at uh, sub-zero minus 30 degrees, you can keep uh, lean fish much longer than you can fatty fish. Interesting. And uh, there's also a question in the- um, I saw it, yeah, go ahead. Um, the, the graph I got from Dalhousie University out of Canada, and I, I, it's been a number of years ago that I pulled that graph off their website uh, from an article they had and that's, I went there today looking for it to see if they had any updated graphs that were better, and I couldn't find it. So I don't know if you can find it online. If you want me to email you the JPEG of it, I can. If you want to send me an email or uh, contact me through Facebook, and I'll be happy to send it to you. And I did see your um, question about best suppliers. We're going to get into that, I promise. But Dan, briefly, or anyone, I keep saying Dan, sorry. <laughs> um, briefly, why do seahorses need, like, we, we very, we, we, we say things like, oh, seahorses galt, they just need fatty, or omega-3 and fatty f acid foods. But can you dive into that a little more, like explain it to somebody who doesn't really know what the heck you're talking about? Well, seahorses <laughs> cannot produce the high chain of fatty acids. They have to get that from their diet. And they've adapted to where they eat a diet that's high in fatty acids. And, you know, that's through shrimp, that's through amphipods and many of the copepods. And generally speaking, most of what they eat is high in it. So we want to try to replicate that in captivity. And, you know, by nature, shrimp is a fatty acid type. Um, if you look at human, the shrimp that humans eat, you know, it too is high in fatty acids. So. Um, yeah, and, and Tammy kind of discussed how, uh, you know, evolution, seahorse evolution just led them to not 
do things the same as other fish. She did, she did a great, I won't try to uh, butcher her, her explanation, but I just wanted to say that because I, you know, I hear people say things like galt and I, you know, I see the looks on people's faces like, okay, what's that? So, um, definitely check out, uh, Tammy's video again, uh, to get that, to get more information on that. Um, and kind of a sciencey question again but what's the lip what's the thing with lipids what's the deal with that with what lipids same deal L yeah lipids are your fats oh <laughs> there you go i knew that i'm sure everybody in the audience did too right okay anyways um i know we're jumping around but i do want to ask the question sarah um asked sarah jane cox asked in the comments who is who do you guys think is the best supplier for frozen feeds like, where do you go to get the right shipping, proper quality? I, if possible, I recommend not having it shipped. I recommend hunting around for a local supplier that has it, if possible. Um, if you got somebody that stores it properly and you can get it locally, you're going to do much better than with shipping. Even the best shippers at times can run into problems where the stuff doesn't arrive in the same condition it should. You know, left the, left the, this whoever we're shipping it from do people really have local frozen food thing because i sure I, I mean petco uh, or PetSmart, one of the two carries hikari locally right no i know but the, yeah, yeah okay the store in my area i which i won't name um it's always brown in their free fridge so or freezer excuse me so uh hopefully you guys have better uh places the, in your the, areas the key is to find a store that has a high turnover mm -hmm. and, that means they're ordering it more frequently. If you're ordering it online, it's going to be trial and error, and that's going to be a toughie. Yeah. Um, I've received before, you know, I used to order stuff by the cases, and, you know, I remember one time I ordered some PE, and when it showed up at the doorstep, it was brought by DHL, and it not only was it the box damage and stuff falling out of the styrofoam container, but they were all, you know, completely defrosted. And it it was smelly when they delivered it. Oh yeah, I've ha I've had that happen too. I, I really have. Um, and I do see some more questions in the comments. Thank you guys. The more questions you ask, the more we can chat about it. Um, but really quickly, because one of the one of the alternatives um, that used to be an option was like I'm gonna I'm gonna probably butcher it, but socks or sachets um, who sold live mices. You can't do that all the time. It gets expensive, but are they even still, um, are there still places selling live? I was just curious. Well, Saks is. Socks, and Saks. Reed, I think, is not anymore. I think I heard Chad say something that uh, they weren't currently doing it. The guy that used to supply them is no longer in business. And mm. it's, you know, it's very tough to find aquacultured mice. It's, I used to sell them. In fact, the way I used to culture them was really simple and um, very easy. You gotta remember my tanks were bigger and I had round tanks, but what I used to do was I would start a batch of fry and I would introduce a handful of mices into the tank. Mm -hmm. And the mices would play cleanup crew and of course the knops would be additional food source, but that population would rapidly expand because they would eat the same food as a fry. Right. And then once the fry got to about six to eight weeks, they were big enough, they started chasing the live mice, and that population started dropping. I just started adding frozen food, and that was really all it took. But yeah. I could pull easily 100, 200, 300 mice out of a fry system, you know, very quickly. Uh, the, the population would get that thick. Gotcha. Um, and I do want to mention, just really quickly, one of the sponsors of the MACNA 2020 online seahorse and pipefish event was Herb from U.S. Mycids, and Paula discussed, um, Paula Carlson discussed how Herb it does an excellent job of providing live mycids for the, for the, you know, public aquariums, and he's actually um, working on possibly figuring out a way to supply the same things to hobbyists. I did put him in contact with Dan recently, and so um, hopefully we'll have more to talk about there very soon. But socks is wonderful for sure, and there's a few others too. Um, I could try to look them up and link them when we're done. But, uh, and actually there was one more question before I move on, on in that topic. Is the size, uh, Gary Fu asked, is the size of mysis 
a concern for small uh, care pace. I, I'm probably pronouncing it C A R A P A C E. A concern for smaller seahorses. Like it's the size of the mice that's the concern. I'd Anybody? say uh, B E is too big for uh, juvenile standard uh, seahorses, like uh, the juvenile Erectus uh, can have problems with uh, some of the size PE that I've had. Um, but uh, Ray, Barbary, is that, sorry. The Barbary are probably just one of the smaller species that I've kept. And uh, I think he just as adults, uh, they don't have any problem with it. My particular problem with them is they're not fussy on it, that's all. He didn't freeze for me, Dan. I, I did hear you. Um, and Ray, I'm curious, so is P.E. Mysis what you feed your seahorses then? No, no, I, I like the Hikari Mysis. Um, and, any reason? I Well, I guess partly because uh, uh, over the years, uh, just about all my uh, seahorses have uh, willingly taken to the Hikari, mm. but uh, I have had problems with a lot of seahorses uh, that just were not interested in the, uh, the PE. Mm. Why, I don't know. But I'd like to make another comment. Uh, yeah. Dan was suggesting uh, to buy from a local store your frozen packs. Um, if you uh, get in, uh, in the good, on the good side of them, and uh, arrange for them to call you when their new stock comes in so you can pick it up same day. Uh, that would be advantageous because as he said, these uh, viewing fridges that they have uh, or freezers do not keep it even as cold as what your uh, fridge in a, your freezer in the fridge is going to keep it at home. So, uh, if it's sitting in there for a week, it's uh, going to deteriorate a hell of a lot faster than uh, if you have it sitting. Uh, um, Pick it up that own, day, right? Your own freezer. Yeah. For me, uh, because I get twelve packs at a time, and it doesn't matter if he's got some in stock or not. Um, after that first episode, now he will order in the full twelve packs, and he calls me up uh, to let me know that it's in this shipment. He hasn't unpacked it yet, but uh, I head out to it. And by the time I get to the store, it's over half an hour to get there. And uh, uh, he has it unpacked by then. I get it home and I throw it in the big freezer and I haven't had any problem. Nice. But, uh, I used to have a lot of problems in the years before when I was just buying at the stores. Quite often I had to take what was available and uh, I wasn't happy with what I was getting. Right. I what that's one of my major questions is what is it? What really happens when you feed low quality foods? But we'll get to that. I'm curious. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, in regards to the question, as far as the size of the carapace goes, carapace. what I find is is there's two things. One, it can be species dependent, and two, and we could be talking about the difference between fry and adults. Um, most fry you want the it sized appropriately for adults there are some seahorses erectus are a great example you can put a, a huge piece of shrimp in there or they'll go after some live shrimp sometimes that are much too big for them to eat and they will literally snick it apart and and eat it by section by section um so it really my depends upon the seahorse it. what's that my abs won't touch it yeah, it, it can vary greatly. And sometimes even individuals within, I, I've seen the abdominalis that I had just tear it apart. Um, but it's, you know, it, there's variabilities there. If the seahorses are eating it, it's good. If they're not, then you want to go to something smaller. Right. I'll never forget my barbori, uh, and Tammy mentioned this in the video too, uh, heck, would not eat pieces. So that my female barbori would inspect that piece of food if it did not have eyeballs if it did not look like a shrimp she was not touching it so uh but and then in that in my case unfortunately the pe mice they were too big for her that she just couldn't it didn't work out so i had to like really i had a, I had a hard time with her but i'm curious holly what what do you use 
I buy the Hikari and I get it from a local fish store about probably 35 minutes from where I live. And it's always good quality. They actually don't keep it in a case where you can see it. It's behind the counter, like Ooh. in a big freezer. Nice. And when I buy it, they wrap it up for me in multiple brown bags. It always makes it home really frozen. And we keep our freezer and refrigerator colder than most people. Ours is super cold. So I've, I've never had a problem. And I've never bought it online. I've never had to. So, so nice. I'm, I'm coming. I'm moving happened. into your area. <laughs> well, this store, though, is the only um, marine fish place for a very long ways because I live in a pretty remote area. So I don't really have another choice. We have um, we have Petco and Pet Smart in the area, but they don't carry that because they don't really cater to people saltwater. doing reefs and saltwater tanks. So if that one fish store ever went under, I'd be in trouble. Hey, there is a big shout out right there. That's why we support local fish stores for sure. Whether it's a little more expensive or not, you need them. They're helping people. Absolutely great point, Holly. And bravo to them. You know, I'm so I'm so glad that you do have that option. Um, yeah, I need yeah. somebody to come to my town and, and set up a marine store. Please, please. All right. Um, Marina, uh, real quick, I'm just curious. Uh, do you have any problem getting frozen foods that are of quality where you are, and which do you prefer? Oh. Sorry, I was just working. Sorry, the microphone was being a bit funny. Um, we have a few brands of frozen mices we can get here, and I always get it from um, one of my local fish shops and it tends to be frozen and look fine um the only thing i'm sort of wondering what you guys think about is all of our mices in australia is radiated before we get it so mm. abs we don't have an option that hasn't been thought out it all of it is um radiated when it gets to the border because i guess it's a hazard or something so um what do you guys think about that and how that would affect um, it's nutrition and things like that. Anyone? Because I, I hadn't even heard of that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. One more time, Marina. I was distracted. So I was just saying we don't actually have an option for frozen mice in Australia that hasn't been radiated. All of ours gets radiated when it comes into the country. So it's all been thawed and refrozen. And I was wondering what you guys think about how that whole radiation thing um, actually affects the nutrition of the mysis, which is why um, I think it's pretty important to also enrich stuff and buy stuff that is enriched. I would probably, if I was in that area, I would look around and see if there was some live foods I could augment into the diet. Because are you saying that you think that the radiation is kind of probably killing some of the nutrition? Well, if it's being defrosted it and and brought back, then yeah. Go ahead, Marina. Yeah, um, I've looked into it quite a bit, and it actually even um, degrades the protein and the fats and and everything. <laughs> As it was before it was radiated. Why, why are they doing that? I think it's a biosecurity thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to yep. my understanding, it's a biosecurity thing. So we don't actually have anyone in Australia producing frozen mice, which would sort of solve that problem, which would be great. Wow. Have you talked to Chris at all about what they use? I haven't. I, I think Chris uses a, mainly live, to, you know, pretty sure. Yeah, but I would ask him and then see if he has a source for getting some other foods to augment the diet. Chris, if you're watching, jump in here. We need to. If not, um, Marina, I'll hit him up later, too, because I'd like to know the answer to that. 
Um, and Gary Foods that says there's not a lot of options of live foods uh, in Melbourne, but we, we have a lot of live copra pods and even live brine shrimp, but they aren't always available, right? Go ahead, Maria. Yeah, if live, live brine shrimp is available, if you enrich it correctly, that can be a, a nice way to augment relatively inexpensively. And quickly, what's the important thing to look for in enrichment? Like, what, is, what does brine shrimp not have that mysis does that you need to supplement? Well, brine shrimp is high in protein, but it sucks when it comes to the fatty acid profile. It has some EPA, but none of the DHA. So if you're looking for an enrichment, you want an enrichment that is high in DHA, ideally a very high DHA to EPA ratio. And that will, the problem is, is that when you enrich artemia, they rapidly catabolize the DHA back down to D, to EPA. So you want a really high DHA component in the, the enrichment. Sorry, guys. Exactly. Um, any names come to mind? Uh, the reason I'm really yep. asking this is so many people use, we kind of come to find out doesn't have what we need, right? No, no. Most of your microalgaes aren't going to have a very high DHA component to them. They'll have some, uh, some of them, but it's not very high and it's not high enough. Um, if you can't find algae mac or something similar to that down there, then I would look for a Selco, and that will probably be your next best bet. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Marina, did you have anything else you were trying to say or question? Uh, no, that's covered it. Yeah. So um, yeah. it's just, I guess, a little different, I guess, depending on where you are. Absolutely. And I would say most of us are probably jealous about all your options to get live feeds uh, in Australia, but I'm sure that comes at a cost. And, you know, hearing your problems getting frozen feeds, that, that really sucks. So it does depend on where you are for sure. Um, we have a lot. Yeah, we've got a lot of frozen foods available. It's just that thing of um, they're all radiated. Yeah. I, I had never heard that. That's that's crazy. I'm gonna, I'm I'm hitting Chris up with whether you do or not. <laughs> um, okay, and I I know we're jumping around, guys. I just don't do good when I have notes. I'd rather just sit here and talk to y'all. But what? Why do? Does anybody know why it's so important to make sure you're feeding quality foods? Like, obviously, you know, a lot of people don't even have any idea. They just buy the the mice at PetSmart. It might be brown. They don't know. And uh, bottom line is you feed it and nothing happens immediately. Everything seems fine, the seahorses eat it. Sometimes they won't, sometimes they'll sn I think they sniff it, but of course they can't sniff it. Anyways, sometimes I just notice they won't eat it if it looks pretty, if it's, if, if it's bad, but a lot of times they will. And what happens? Dan? <laughs> well, the, the fats get oxidized, they go rancid and the proteins can break down and you end up with, uh, as, as Tammy was saying, a bunch of free radicals. And the free radicals will, will consume some of the vitamins that act as uh, um, antioxidants, if you will, within the animal. So you're depleting the reserve of antioxidants from the animal. And for us non sciencey people, what does that lead to? Well, it means that you, despite the fact that you're feeding them, you're, you're, they're not getting the right nutrition, and the, the addition is really a subtraction of certain things. So, you know, it's what they were saying in the, the video uh, from Magna, they were talking about supplementing, and I'm not a big fan of trying to put enriched frozen food. I'm a believer in taking live food to encapsulate it, to feed them if you want to give them things elsewise. I just don't believe that soaking mice in enrichment is good enough. Um, and if you don't rinse it, you're just polluting the tank. So. Uh, really quick about that. Um, what about when they claim to have enriched, say, brine shrimp and then flash frozen it? Is that BS or is that better than it, regular? Like they enriched them when they were live and then. Well. Hikari, for example, says that they enrich their mices before harvesting. Um, PE is taken from the lake. In theory, they've been feeding before they were harvested. 
Um, most of them are, that are, are going to be frozen very quickly. You know, there's different terminologies and different techniques, but most of them, it's imperative with, with fish to do the freeze rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So they do. And, um, you know, I, I have customers that have, you know, had seahorses for 10 plus years and fed them nothing but frozen food. And that was it and had success doing it. So mm -hmm. I'm not as crazy about trying to get all kinds of other things in there. I do believe it's, it's better for them to give them some variety and, you know, when possible, gut load some adult brine shrimp, buy some live mice, some amphipods or what have you. Uh, I do think that's beneficial, but, you know, I, I have to say, I've got customers that have had the same seahorses for seven, eight, nine years, and one customer 11 years that uh, fed frozen mice. Which is, which is good. I mean, I'm so glad to hear that. And Ray just covered one of the questions in the comments, but we need to cover it live. Um, let's see. Sarah Jane Cox asked, should frozen foods be soaked in enrichment? You kind of covered that, but can we say why uh, that doesn't work out? I, I can tell you why, but I'd probably be better to show you. Okay, show us. Um, let me get it set up. I got a video of why I rinse mysis. Oh, yay. Okay. Well, then while, while you're, let, let me know when you're ready and I'll, I'll jump to you. But um, Ray, what was your response? Well, basically, uh, very little will uh, get uh, taken into the frozen uh, food, whether it's frozen brine or frozen mice. Uh, whatever, and you throw it in the tank, uh, most of it's going to wash off. A little bit will get to the seahorses, but most of it's uh, going to go to enable the bacterial expansion. Add to the organics, bottom line. Right. Um, and what was I going to ask? Oh, so we kind of went around. I, I jumped around. Well, I'm, Dan, just let me know when you're ready. But we jumped around a bit talking about which frozen food you did did prefer and why. Um, and I just wanted to mention that's another thing that Tammy kind of covered, um, that the, the profile, the nutritional profile um, of PE mysis versus Sakari, they have purposes, you know, they have different pur purposes. She, she kind of mentioned that when you have, you, you would use PE mysis to fatten a seahorse up, to, you know, prepare them to breed, that kind of thing. But Hikari overall has more of the staple diet, everyday thing that people need. All right, Dan, you ready? Let me make sure uh, I cut you. I can't see. Do, you have, do I have it up on the screen? Yes. Yeah. You can see the uh, mysis? Yep. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and play it, and I'll comment as I'm playing it. Okay. Um, so what I'm getting ready to do is take a pound of frozen mysis and... Uh, I've already defrosted it, and my method for defrosting is lay it out on a um, granite counter, and it, within about five to ten minutes, it's already defrosted. And normally I go straight to a sieve, but here I put water in it, and I've got a bowl so I can catch the water. And what I do is I take the frozen mice as I pour it through a sieve. In this case, I'm doing it over a bowl so you can see what the water looks like. Now, this is a pound. And this isn't rinsing it, it's just mixing water with it and then draining it. And the water you see there is excess Ooh. organics. And granted, that's a pound, but if you're feeding mice, you know, over a period of time, that's what you're adding to the tank. Mm. And as you can see, there's a lot of stuff there. And then, of course, like I said, I didn't rinse it. So now I go ahead and rinse it, and I rinse it thoroughly. Um, I'm using a sieve there because I'm doing a pound. But you could take, um, like if you're doing cubes or brine shrimp networks, just fine. I'm just using plain cold tap water. And I essentially rinse until it's clear. Once it's clear, then I'm ready to go to the next step. But that bowl is why I don't add enrichments to frozen mices, because it's going to wash off and look like that in the tank. Mm. Um, now, once I'm done rinsing it, um, which at some point here, I'll finish. Um, <laughs> you're thorough. I, I do rinse it very well. Um, then I go ahead and put it in a container. I use a glass container because it's something I can clean very easily. It doesn't have scratches and harbor bacteria. The sieve will end up going in the dishwasher to be uh, cleaned. Mm. And once I have it in the thing, I add some vitamin C. In this case, it's just plain ascorbic acid. Tammy was talking about using calcium ascorbate, which is another form of vitamin C. 
um, this film I did about, I don't know, three, four, three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I currently use a scorbal palmitate, which is a fatty acid type of vitamin C. Got a lipid to it. And here mm -hmm. I just mix up the vitamin C and I pour it in and then I'll add some uh, more water to it. And by doing that, we feed s several times a day. So I don't want to do this each time I'm doing a feeding. So I mix it up and I'll keep that for 24 hours and the vitamin C keeps it from turning brown. If you took two containers and did it the exact same way, added vitamin C to one and didn't to the other, you would see the one without the vitamin C turn brown real quick. This mm -hmm. one generally takes 24 hours before it starts turning color. So vitamin C, gotcha. And do you store that in the refrigerator? I do. I okay. store it in the refrigerator and then I just take it out Then the fork I use for scooping it out and feeding, you know, the different tanks. And do you worry about the, I've heard a lot of people talk about um, even thawing the frozen mice in the refrigerator because, you know, like the example I always hear is, would you, would you thaw your shrimp, your shrimp you're going to eat out on the counter? So I'm just curious why you don't feel that's a big deal. I'm sorry. I was trying to figure out how to get the hell back in here. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> you, you mentioned that, um, that, you just thaw your, your mysis on the counter. Um, and yes. obviously you're going through the process of rinsing it and adding vitamin C to it and all these things that most people don't do. But many have made the point that you shouldn't thaw on the counter because just like you wouldn't thaw your own frozen shrimp. And, and Tammy actually did say some. She discussed it a little bit about thawing in the refrigerator. So I don't know the science. I'm just asking why you don't think that's a big deal. Well, because... If I put it in the refrigerator, in my refrigerator, it's going to take several hours to defrost. And that sometimes it can take, you know, longer than that. It's still waiting for it to defrost. Um, the problem is, is the temperature is coming down to where, you know, as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, your breakdown is starting to occur faster and faster and faster. By defrosting it quickly, I feel like I have less damage than it taking hours to defrost. So I do it quickly and sometimes I don't even wait for it to be completely defrosted. I'll use the rinsing to finish mm. defrosting it and, you know, treat it and then put it back in the fridge. Makes sense. And, and key, the key, I think really key here is that you're treating it. You're, you're mixing it with vitamin C and, and extra steps just out of curiosity though. So like any fear of bacteria that, attacks grows quickly while it's thawing at room temperature does that like get washed off when you're rinsing or what happened to your volume mine yeah do i sound quiet you got quieter you're never quiet <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna do it live <laughs> right? do, uh guys am i quiet to you guys or just in there you go yeah. okay I didn't touch anything. I think somebody was telling me to shush, but all I asked was anyone fearing thawing on the counter. Obviously you do what you do. You, whoever's watching you do you, if it's a concern of yours, thaw it in the fr fridge, you know, but, um, I, I'm just curious because the threat is bacteria growing on it quickly because it's at room temperature. Does that like get washed off when you're rinsing or? Well, some might, but if any, if it's got bacteria in there, the bacteria were in there before it was packaged. So it's a sealed package. So it was not getting bacteria introduced. It's just what's already there. And I suspect it could be, you know, in there. I don't think you're going to rinse all of it off if it is there. But the vitamin C, on the other hand, will uh, slow down bacterial growth. Oh, cool. All right. So people that, um, what do you think? And anybody guys, I don't mean to just keep calling, picking on Dan, but, um, wh what do you think when people thaw their frozen mices in like tank water on the counter? Um, and why is that different and bad? Well, I see a lot of people that use tank water. I, I read it, see it in the, the forums all the, or the message boards all the time where, well, I just rinse it with tank water or I store it in tank water. Well, tank water is already bacterial laden, and I want to use water that, that is clean, new water that's not full of bacteria uh, when I'm doing anything with my foods. 
and you just showed that you rinse with tap water so that it doesn't that doesn't affect anything right now there's another argument about that as far as you know that people worry about what's in the tap water you should use you know salt water or ro water and you know if you look around at the commercial people um and i've talked to a number of people in the commercial settings that uh do aquaculture we all use tap water that's it. Well, I'm curious, uh, Colin, on, I'm not going to pick on anybody name by name, but do you guys all rinse your foods or do you do something differently? I, I do now. I rinse in tap water and that's also how I defrost it. I ah. just take it out, I put it in a sieve and I hold it under the tap water until it's soft and clean. And then what I do, and I don't know that this is true, but I've kind of heard that if you don't put it in salt water, it'll float a little bit. So what I do is I put the sieve in a tiny dish of salt water and suck it up with a turkey baster and put it in their dish. Hmm. And the baby seahorses, um, I actually will put it directly in there. You know, I rinse theirs, but I don't, I don't care if it's fresh water because if it floats a little more, it takes longer to get to the bottom. So they have more of a chance to grab it. Interesting. And I, I thought, and I don't know that it's true about the fresh water, you know, making it float more, but I think I've kind of noticed there is something to that. See, and I, I had always thought that if the mice is float, <laughs> that that's an indication that they're not good. So it just shows we're hearing different things. Um, anyone have a thought or? And also the exoskeletons that are mixed in with it. When they do a gather, they're not uh, completely separating that. I haven't noticed a big difference between salt and fresh water. Um, and I've done both, you know, when I, in the, the video there I was using salt water because that was what was most handy available but mm -hmm. you know I have no qualms right now I'm using fresh water only and I I actually would prefer it to float a little bit longer so that mm -hmm. they're attacking it in a water column as opposed to going down sitting on the bottom mm -hmm. now somebody using a feeding dish would be a little bit different you know where they want it to stay put yeah my adults use a dish you know but the babies don't so that's the difference well, now I want to know why, Holly. So we're, we're assigning you that task. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm kidding, but go figure it out. Go do the, go do an experiment and teach us. No, uh, but anybody who watches this later, what are your thoughts? Um, I wonder if anyone has really looked into the reasoning and what happens salt versus fresh water. That's really interesting, actually. Um, anybody else, do you guys, uh, I'm not, I'm, I, I really hate calling on you guys by name, but anyone else uh, have a different way of thawing or does, or do you not rinse foods or do you see that a lot online? Cause I do too. And I'm, I always f feel like I don't want to, you know, like jump in and say, Hey, you really need to rinse the food, but go ahead. No, the unfortunate thing is, is that when I was selling a lot of seahorses, I would talk every person I sold to, I spoke to him on the phone before I shipped. And we had an opportunity to answer questions and educate people. And, you know, people were comfortable calling us when they had questions or emailing or texting us. And, you know, we were able to spread the word very well. And what I'm seeing today is I'm starting to see it more and more and more. Some of these basic things crop up where, you know, it's just like rinsing the food. It's People, a lot of people just aren't doing it. I feel like we repeat ourselves a lot, like we cover the same topics. Ray, who has been with me from like day one on Wine Wednesday, he's probably had to repeat the same things 20 times. But it's getting, you know, you're, it, it, people keep asking the same questions, which is totally fine, of course. But we want to make sure that the good information gets out there. And big announcement, guys, that's next week's topic, surprise, is where to ask and find information why it's important to know who you're getting information from and along those lines. I'll come up with some clever title, but that's next week's I topic. Get upset, uh... In the beginning, I didn't rinse food and it was just because I didn't know why. Right. You know, nobody was there to tell me that. 
Right. And, and did we actually ever say what? Said, oh, by the way, you need to rinse the food, you know, till right. I finally talked to people that said, oh, well, you need to rinse the food because of the bacteria and, the, and it's dirty, you know, like Dan just showed us in the video. Yeah. And but keep in mind how Ikari is. Somebody tells you, you don't know that. And, and yes. And right. Holly, wait, Holly, I really appreciate you pointing that out because that's if I'm sounding like uh anything other than an agreement to that absolutely like i wouldn't know if somebody hadn't told me so we just need to make sure that we get the good information out there and that we provide resources so that people can know and learn and you know go ahead Dan. keep in mind that was hikari that i was doing and hikari is one of the cleaner things of mice you can buy right um one thing before i forget when you're rinsing your mice is is this, this sounds like a silly question but i'm being serious when when i had my very picky barbori female who had to see eyeballs on anything she ate and it had to look like food um do you notice that the rinsing breaks it up a lot and causes little or pieces or am i maybe personally rinsing too hard I think well, I, they're already in there, the smaller pieces. They are. I don't think you're breaking it. I think there's just inherently some smaller pieces in it. I, I generally don't use a pressure washer to rinse it. <laughs> Darn it. That's what I did wrong. No. Gotcha. And now, ever... to, Holly's, to Holly's point a moment ago about rinsing it and defrosting it, that works very well for small quantities, and that's yeah. probably a smart way to go. Um, the reason I don't do that is that it takes forever when you've got a pound of mice to rinse it under tap water to defrost it. Yeah, I could see that. You have a lot. <laughs> but for the average hobbyist, great suggestion, Holly. You just told, you know, all of us, you know, who don't need that much food every time, a great way to do it. So thank you. And Ray, were you going to speak? Well, a couple things. Uh, one, uh, I've got, I've forgotten now, but the last thing there with Dan, I was just wondering he, when he does a full pound at a time, have you ever weighed the rinsed and uh, dripped uh, uh, package to see how much you actually end up with? You mean as far as weighing it to see? Yeah. No, I, I haven't. Um... It basically comes in about half the, half the weight. <sighs> About 250 odd grams, sometimes 270 at the highest point, but uh, that can be variable just because of how much uh, I've let drip. Uh, and that's preservatives and in, in water? The is packing fluids uh, that is packed in. Yeah, he's talking about the, the net weight of the package. I do, but I'm saying like, uh, is that because, why? Why, why, why well, is that 454 the way it is? grams to start with. And uh, I get your calculation. I'm just wondering why. That it's 454 grams in that package. They're not saying that the shrimps themselves are 454 grams. It's the same. Uh, I go to the store and if I buy uh, canned ham. So you're just pointing out the dishonesty of it. Pound and a half okay. on it. And uh, when I weigh it, it's uh, probably less than three quarters of that is the actual meat and the rest is the packing fluids that are in the can with it. And this is the same kind of thing. It's the packaging fluids in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there's preservatives in yep. it as well. And uh, so when you rinse it all off and you weigh what you actually have left, uh, it's not much better than half. Well, that that uh, is a great point um, in that the Hikari goes with wet weight in terms of their analysis and their packaging and what have you. And Gary asked the question about, uh, or he made the comment uh, that about mice as being freshwater or brackish or lower in DHA and EPA. Yep. Um, it's interesting because people get real confused with the nutritional breakdown on mice because of the way it's done. Some companies use wet weight, some companies use dry weight. Uh, a great example is Hikari uses wet weight, PE uses dry. And if you convert the wet weight to a dry weight and then compare the two, they're actually much closer than you think. For example, Hikari is 70% protein, PE is 69.5%. Um, Fat-wise, if you go to dry weight, dry weight uh, Hikari is 6.7%. 
where PE is 8.35%. And um, PE is a freshwater mycid, and Hikari is a brackish water. Um, I think what happens in terms of the, the fatty acids, when you look at freshwater, brackish, and saltwater, I think they have close to the same amounts of fatty acids, but they're a little bit different. I think you're going to find a higher DHA to EPA ratio in the saltwater. Um, I tried to get a breakdown from Hikari on theirs with the fats, and they refused to oblige. And I wanted to do a direct comparison between them and PE, and PE was willing to give me the information, but it was useless without the information from Hikari to compare it to. Hey, Tammy. That is something that I think was the origination of the, the fact people said brine shrimp had no nutrition. Hmm. Because when you looked at the brine shrimp frozen package, it would say uh, 7 or 8% protein. Right. That's, because, That's wet weight. Because that was wet uh, weight uh, figures, it wasn't a true comparison with maybe you were buying mysis and it'd give you a different factor, way higher, but it was a dry weight figure. You're comparing with wet weight, but people didn't know that. Right. It's scary. Um, we see it all the time in the hobby where people, do, they think that uh, PE is so much more nutritious and I'm not gonna argue whether one's more nutritious or not, that's not the argument, but right. the appearance is, is that it's much higher in nutrition when in reality, they're using dry weight and the others are using wet weight. Well, and I don't mean to keep bringing up the video, guys, but Tammy actually gave um, some, some comparisons on the two and what she suggests in the video. So I think she would agree with you, Gary, <laughs> about what your statement was. Um, but anyhow, also Gary had mentioned or asked, Ismer, and I see your question, Sarah, and we thank you for all of the questions, you guys, because that's what we, we don't want to give a presentation here. We want the Seahorse community to come together and ask questions. And if I'm wrong, Dan's going to tell me. If Dan's wrong, you better believe I'm telling him. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but Gary asked, is marinating in enrichment overnight, then rinsing them off in the morning a possible idea? It's possible, but my answer to Gary is, is that imagine for a moment, it depends upon what you're doing it with. If you're doing it with a substance that can penetrate into, permeate through the, the flesh of the mices, you're liable to get some in there. Um, but it's almost like, you know, doing chicken. If you sprinkle something on the chicken, if it doesn't absorb into the chicken and then you rinse it off and, and go to eat it, your, your stuff is gone. And um, some of the stuff that you put in there for enrichment just doesn't permeate into the, the flesh of the, of the uh, mices. Some of it will, some of the staining stuff, you get some color and what have you. But, you know, I just, for me, it's so much, so much better to bioencapsulate it into adult artemia, which will consume it and you can get it a, a lot, a significantly more into the target by doing it that way. And have you, I, I, I'm gonna ask Sarah's question right in a moment, but have you ever ha heard or seen or experienced anyone that had issues due to soaking in these um, yes, the enrichments time. that are recommended by some companies and people? Um, just yeah, the, the, the problem that I see is so there's twofold. Number one, if you're gonna try to let it marinate uh, overnight. Well, that's that means it's sitting there unused and sitting at a warmer temperature for a longer period of time, breaking down. And um, the other problem I've had is people that have put a lot of enrichments on their food and then fed it out. You know, I've had several people with weak SNC, um, gas bubble issues and whatnot. And in order to reduce the organics in the system, we changed their habits of how they fed. And that went a long ways towards solving the problem. Because it's always the darn organics. That's, that's what it always boils down to. And that's terrible yeah. when people are trying to do something good for their seahorses and they end up, you know, it ends up being more, uh, you know, best deeds kind of thing. Best deeds go unpunished. Okay. Um, 
was gonna, I had another question right away. I'm gonna ask actually Sarah's question, sorry. So how do I get the DHAs and fatty acids they need if I only feed frozen, if adding it to frozen really doesn't work? So Dan, you made a comment earlier that you have had multiple clients only feed frozen rices, not do the enrichment of live feeds, and just succeed. So would you yes. just say it's better off if you're gonna feed frozen only to make sure you get quality frozen and then rinse that, it and that, feed it? That would be the approach I would take. Okay, so, and I say that all the time too, cause Sarah, I feel you, you know, we throw all this stuff out here and it's like, oh my gosh, what's next? <laughs> I get it, I get it. But these people that have been doing this forever kind of really figured things out luckily. So as long as we actually listen to them, it's not as hard as it seems. I mean, you you don't. I personally feed frozen mices. I make sure it's clear in color, white colored. I I like Hikari and PE. I don't, I don't know the science about which one's better or any of that stuff. I just try to. Uh, I, it's harder for me to get um, PE, frankly. And some of my seahorses wouldn't take it because it's in such a bigger size. But so I feed Hikari as I normal. I make sure it's clear. I rinse it. I feed it. And then what I personally do is go to some place like Sox or um, hopefully U.S. Mycid soon. Wink, wink. That wasn't a very good wink. Anyways, and then I get either Artemia or Mycids or whatever once in a while when I can, when I can afford it, when it's, you know, when I feel like my seahorses need a treat. And then I'll do all the enrichment stuff. But I know I'm rambling, but bottom line is you don't have to do all of these things. A lot of the things we talk about are focused on people wanting to breed their seahorses. Like you can do things to get them in the mood with boots and stuff like that. But I was curious, Dan, one of the other things that, um, cause we say don't soak the foods in some of these enrichments, but how do you feel? Cause I know what you've told me before. Um, how do you feel about vitamin C? I mean, I'm sorry, not vitamin C. I meant like garlic and, and that kind of thing. You already said vitamin C, sorry. Yeah, the garlic, I would not want to feed to the seahorse on a constant basis. You know, I might do it if I had a sick seahorse or trying to get him to entice him to eat. But uh, my understanding is that garlic is not good for most marine animals anyway. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and yeah, Sarah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I'm definitely not saying there's anything wrong with PE. Uh, I don't think any of us are doing that. Uh, but yeah, check out if you can get Hikari and maybe come back and let us know if how, you know how it affected your seahorses. We'd love to hear. Um, anyone else have comments about that or thoughts about that? Like PE, Hikari, that kind of thing? I guess not. Okay. Um, what, what, uh, I know I've jumped all over the place, Dan, but what are, what are the important, important things that I've not asked about? Um, anything that you could think of that I've really seriously jumped over? Oh, uh, sorry, reading my little notes here. I'm doing so good. Just, I wanted to mention, again, Tammy mentions it in the video that I, I started to ask the question earlier, like, okay, so, you know, we feed our seahorses. If somebody didn't know to rinse the foods, obviously we've talked about organics can become an issue in the long term. Um, but if you didn't know that the, you know, the coloring matters or the refreezing of the frozen food matters and you can only get your food, you know, food from PetSmart or wherever and they, and maybe yours happens to not be a great one and the mysis is always brown and you feed it to your seahorses and nothing happens. They eat it. They act like it's fine. And Dan went into the sciencey stuff, but Dan cannot weak snick vitamin E deficiency. You, you explained that sometimes the seahorse is eating and not getting the nutrition that they need, but are there any other things like that that uh, you'll see long term when you're not feeding quality foods? Well, the, the weak snick, you know, it's interesting that uh, Tammy brought up the, the uh, myopathy with the muscles, you know, the she has an article on her um, or had it on fused jaw where a veterinarian came in and talked about, you know, that the, the food breaking down and feeding it can cause myopathy within the, the muscles. And she was attributing that to weak snick. And what I, what I see more so in the hobby is it's more from parasites than it is from my, from muscles deteriorating. And, um, 
not, I would say well over 90% of the time I'm successful in resolving it with customers by attacking it from that angle. Hmm. So, you know, I, I'm not, I must say it doesn't happen because we've had instances with weak SNCC that nothing worked. So that could have been the case. And when I went back and reread the article that the vet wrote, there was no study. It was all hypotheses, what she was talking about. It made sense, but you know, I don't think that's the common thing that we see in the hobby. It might be different in the public aquaria world, but within the hobby, it's more from the buildup. But we go back to the food, and if we're feeding food that is, uh, you know, if we're not rinsing it, if we're putting a lot of stuff on it and just dumping it in the tank, what I see is from the average hobbyist is somewhere between the nine to 12 months, if their filtration is not adequate for the organic loading, then they have a problem with uh, weak snick and uh, gas bubble disease, pouch emphysema, those types of things will crop up in, in around that time frame. Gotcha. Sorry, I got a kid in the background. I'm sorry. The, when my when my cam goes out, guys, it's usually on purpose. I got some kid bugging me. Um, great information. You know, it's interesting. You know that that's why we're going to talk next week about where we, you know what information we can trust and things like that. Um, one of the things that we haven't really jumped into, and then I'm I'm basically going to ask you guys what things you've maybe heard or you learned, like Holly just talked about rinsing that you didn't know before and do now. But one of the things we haven't talked about very much in this in this um, topic is, I mean, we've talked about it before, but not tonight, is what happens to frozen foods that remain at the bottom of the tank for more than half an hour. Um, and Dan just disappeared on us. So um, I'm still here. Okay. How long do you guys allow food to sit. I know Holly and I kind of veered off talking about fry that won't eat stubborn little poops. Um, but do you guys, what do you, how do you make sure that food doesn't sit in the tank and why is it important? Everybody don't jump in. At Actually, I don't want it to uh, sit in there for any length of time. That's why I've spent so much time to determine just how much my seahorses will eat in a given time period, namely 10 to 12 minutes. And uh, the amount, uh, of course, varies with uh, the individual seahorses, but uh, I still, um, I work out how much I can feed to the abs and how much they'll eat in that time period. Now, same time period for the barbs, and it's a, a different amount, obviously, different sizes, but, uh, I don't want to see anything left on the bottom. There's the odd little piece here, there, but that uh, I can take care of at the end of the day when uh, I'm doing a check of the tank and I can suck up little things like that. Um, and I when you to, say, sorry, when you say that you figure it out by down to the T, down to the minutes, and Nicole, I heard you, I'm going to call on you next, but um, when you say you figure that out down to the T, how exactly do you do that? I do that too, but... Can you describe it? Well, I have uh, little micro scales that I bought. Uh, um, oh, heck, I don't go that deep. Go ahead. <laughs> well, they, they measure to 0 0.01 grams. But anyway, um, Sorry. I started off with a certain weight. To, say, when the, when the mysis is drained, I'd weigh off, uh, say, two grams. And I'd feed it to the tank and see how long... Um, it would take them to eat it. And if they couldn't eat it all in that time period, then I cut back and I put less in. Mm -hmm. And uh, till I get to the point where I, I'm i down to where they consistently can consume it in 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and then if and your then, seahorses were thinning, you'd know that they still they weren't getting enough. So it's really, by, go ahead. Right, yeah. Well, then too, I, I feed uh, four times a day. Right. Um, because I think it's better for them to, to eat more times a day and eat less at a time. If Do you, you think feed that them less yeah. at the time, then it's given it more time to go through the digestive tract. And uh, so in addition to not uh, polluting the tank as much, uh, uh, there's more nutrition being absorbed. Sure. Is that kind of a danger for somebody who can't feed four times a day though? Um, if they're trying to, I well, mean, do you, do you need to consider that is what even, I'm saying? Even if you uh, split up, say you get up in the morning, uh, 
you can do a feeding and then uh, say it's three quarters of an hour later, you're gonna go off to work. You can do another feeding then. When you come home from work, you can do a feeding then before you go to bed or uh, even be, uh, before you get to that late. Uh, as long as there's some time between the feeding where they can do a, uh, a more uh, thorough job of digesting what's going through, then uh, you don't need to use as much. But the, the, the multiple feeding, uh, I think, is better for them. And I think in the end, from what my seahorses, what I've observed, uh, I think my seahorses are better equipped to deal with problems. And if something does happen, let's say I screw up and don't uh, get a water change done soon enough and something develops, I think they're better able to handle problems like that. Just cause I think they're healthier. Well, I know for sure the seahorses until this one here has gone skinny now, but up until then, my seahorses always have been fatter now than they ever have been before. Well, I certainly don't disagree because if you're able to feed four times a day and do exactly what you're describing, it's a perfect recipe. But I just also understand that a lot of people, you know, with kids and jobs, you, you made sense. I just know that it's difficult. Before I say what I was going to say, Nicole, what were you going to say? No, all I was going to say is with all this baby madness I've had going on in my house, the nonstop siphoning of, especially with the, you know, the bigger babies, which finally are all eating frozen, they're nine and a half weeks old. Woohoo! I'm still, sup I'm, yeah, I know. I'm still supplementing with some, you know, be enriched BBS just because I want to make sure that they have more than enough. Right. But... I swear to God, I, I, me and Holly were just talking about this before you came on. I swear by the end of the day, like the tank was halfway empty, which I, granted I'm doing a hundred percent water change every day anyway, but I'm like, literally within the last few days, I'm like, duh, use the turkey baster and use the brine trip net and just keep the water in the tank, but get the food out. <laughs> like, such yeah, a silly I feel like thing, I'm but all day long, <laughs> Nicole. <laughs> Seri well, yeah, because I literally, I mean, I have a five and a half gallon tank because there's only three of the, you know, even my largest babies, they're still only about two inches long, so that's more than enough space for them at this at right now. So I'd be down to like probably three gallons out of that, and I was like, why, you know, because <laughs> I kept siphoning more and more out. But I'm like, oh, just use the brine shrimp net to catch the bad stuff and let the water go back in because I. Like I said, I'm doing 100% water change every day anyway. Right. But it was bugging me because it would get so low by the end of the day. I'm stuck. Yeah. I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out. That was just silly. <laughs> no, I know. It's because, you know, we, we do have to figure things out. And again, next week, we're going to talk about where we get good information. But um, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm right there with you. Uh, I think I think it would, ended up being Dan who taught, who taught me... Um, to use an airline, uh, you know, a rigid airline to kind of remove food. But your method kind of sounds pretty smart because what you're saying makes sense. You end up removing water when you do something like that. Um, Every time and yeah. when you only have, a, you know, I'm not having thousands of babies right now. So I don't need a huge tank to raise the, you know, the, as long as they're small, you know, they're, they have more than enough room. They don't even swim around the whole thing yet. So I'm like, this just makes no sense. Why am I emptying out half the sink siphoning food when I can keep the water and get rid of the food? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Just, just think it's dumb that I didn't think of it beforehand. <laughs> well, I think it's great that you're sharing what works for you because, you know, that helps others who have the exact same thought and feeling. So I appreciate <laughs> you sharing. Um, and yeah. Dan, I, I know you've said this so many times before, but why is it important to remove food? after you know, so many minutes. It's interesting. The way that I came about understanding this was trial and error. Way back when I first started, I noticed that, that once I moved the seahorses to frozen foods, they would start dropping. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to stop that was to keep the food off the bottom. And Paula mentioned it in the, in the video about food sitting on the bottom becomes colonized with bacteria. Yeah. And food sits on the bottom for any period of time it's going to rapidly become colonized and you know that's just another way of putting the bacteria into the, the seahorse's gut so whether you're sitting on a counter or sitting in the tank the food just goes bad quickly no i argue that sitting on the bottom of the tank is going to go bad faster than on the counter because mm -hmm. 
you, there's a biofilm on the bottom of the tank that has bacteria and it's going to start trying to colonize that food rapidly. I'm going to guess nobody's going to have an answer for this question, but I'm just curious because I've been guilty of this. I'll admit it. Anybody who watches this and is like, oh my gosh, I just broadcast feed and leave it. And they eat it or the cleanup crew eats it. And Ray, I'll give Ray credit. He has pointed out many times that the cleanup crew might eat it, but they still poop it. And so it's still adding to organics. But my question is, why do the seahorses eat it once it sat down there for half an hour? Why would they do that? Because they're hungry. I mean, <laughs> okay. All right. I guess that's it. I just, I mean. I, I, yeah, I mean, if they, the haven't, if they haven't had enough to eat, then, yeah, they're going to clean up what's left down there. Gotcha. I just, um, yeah, I guess that's true because they can't eat all the time, you know, in the wild. So I guess they don't really care if it's like. I mean, I've seen, when my hair is bad with algae, they'll, they'll eat it right out of watch the algae. Them, if you watch them, they're going to go for the best stuff first. If you were to, say, overfeed and you had a bunch of mice left over and you come along and you feed again, they're going to go for the freshest stuff first. But if you were to leave it and skip a feeding and there's still food sitting on the bottom, then they're going to come along and eat that food. Gotcha. Well, just again, if anybody's watching this and don't ever feel like, oh my gosh, I, whatever, because I can guarantee you I've made every mistake we discuss here. <laughs> and I'm not as calculated as Ray, but that's how I, what I kind of do is I will feed what I think they'll eat. I'll see how they eat it. I personally could be just my seahorses. Maybe I'm cuckoo, but I feel like they kind of, you know, attack it and then slow down. And as we've just discussed, they'll continue to eat and they'll eat later and they'll eat it if it's still there. But I, I almost can physically notice, see when they seem to have had enough and kind of slow down. Again, maybe I'm crazy. Yep. But bottom line is I will I will realize if there's food left over when they've slowed down, I remove it. And then I try to, you know, calculate without scales like Ray. <laughs> but I try to say, OK, I'm going to feed one instead of two cubes next time just to see how that goes and kind of play with it until I get where they're eating everything I give them within, you know, 10 minutes. And I can't do the four, four feedings a day all the time. I try, but go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Um, Noah asked a question about Sorry. target feeding yes. and that way there's no scraps. And I agree with that. The only thing I have about target feeding, and I really don't have a problem with target feeding specifically, but where I find is I get a lot of people that ask me that target feed, how many pieces of mice should a seahorse eat? And, you know, my answer to that is how many pieces are in a cube? And the way I figure is that in general, for most, in most cases, I'm usually feeding about a cube of mice per pair of seahorses. So I don't count how many mice I count how much volume I'm putting in there, you know, gross volume. Um, is that each each feed? Yeah, there's people that will say, do they eat five pieces, six pieces, seven pieces per feeding? And it's like, uh, no, I don't go that route, you know. Um, but you feed a cubomyces per pair each time you feed, and you feed four times. Is that correct? Me? Yes. No, when I was breeding, I was doing seven, eight times a day. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think the whole point he's trying to make is that it's hard to determine. And I have a question about that, too, uh, maybe along with what Marina's saying. But I personally actually, my seahorses gulp up more than that. I almost feed, well, I, I feed like two cubes to three seahorses in one tank. And they eat it all within 10 minutes. So is that overfeeding still, if they're eating it all within 10 minutes? No. Okay. So you just got to kind of figure out your seahorses is the real deal. And as uh, I wanted to say too, Noah, um, I had a pair of seahorses, the Barbori, the, the ones that were so picky um, that if they didn't like the way the food looked and didn't have eyeballs, they weren't going to eat it. And I target fed them every single time. Um, I, I, again, as Dan said, I couldn't answer how many pieces I gave them. Um, I could just tell when they stopped being interested in the food, but that it's a pain in the boutoir, but it works. I mean, I never had food on the floor, never had to worry about it because if I fed it they, and they didn't eat it, I took it out. You know, it's just a painful, <laughs> long process, but 
I see you guys were answering them too also in there. Um, anything else? Marina, did you have any other question? Like how, how much do you feed? I'm curious. I've got just the one now and I right. feed probably about three quarters of the cube, but I've also got a y little yellow coral goby in there. Gotcha. And when you, I, I, that's a good question too. Like if you only have so many and you don't, and you figure out you don't need to feed a, a full cube each time, do you just like chop it frozen and put the rest back or what? I chuck it in the, um, in the reef tank and the corals eat it. Gotcha. Anybody else have that issue where you don't need as much as, or do you feed differently? Anybody? You could just always use a paring knife and just cut the cube. Yeah, that's or what I figured. I use a hammer. <laughs> always, always we have Holly to bring it back to reality. Always. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> but I have to, the, the solution to the problem is always a bigger hammer. <laughs> I love it. Did I miss any other questions or what, uh, what else, guys? I know we, we went long again as per usual. Actually, but go ahead. Ooh, so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you. Um, actually, I have a question for Holly because I know you're huge on raising um, mysis and everything else, and I know you do that in your backyard. But I live in Massachusetts where it gets very cold, as Dan is well aware. <laughs> Um, so I can't keep those outside. What are you feeding them, spirulina? Are you what are you feeding them as you raise yeah. them? Because I have I have some excess. You know what I mean, like stuff that I don't want to feed to the babies after a couple of you know in a few days that I feel like, Ugh, but they're not dead. So I'm trying to see if I could have any success. Well, so I've I seen have, a few different things. So I just was curious. What I have is actually it's just artemia, not mycids, and copepods. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what and, I meant. I'm and sorry. I, that's and I, I find I that both are that pretty hardy. Um, I've read that copepods don't mind cold temperatures. They might even do okay in the winter here when we're like in the 30s. Artemia, I don't know because I haven't studied them that much, but I have them outside too in buckets. And what I do is just try to make sure their water stays kind of green. I feed them either with um, Phyto paste that I freeze, which is what I feed the copepods, or I mix the spirulina powder with water. I think I got the recipe. I think Ray made a post about it once or something with a two liter bottle and a okay. couple of tablespoons of spirulina powder, something like that. And I just go check every couple few days outside and see if the water is still green. I do have a aerator out there. I have a pump actually outside with air tubes for all of them. The right. copepods don't seem to need that. Um, but the artemia, I think, do, because I've had um, cultures I know in the house crash from not having enough oxygen, where there was maybe too much artemia that hatched in too little water, and I didn't get home in time. Mm. Right. Well, yeah, cat. and I noticed once once kind of, once you enrich them, like if you don't feed them within a certain amount of time, they die. They die off, and I, I'm not really sure the reason. I don't well, know if they're I've just like it's too a, much. Dan probably knows. I've learned there's a difference between enriching them and feeding them, mm. which I didn't right. know at first. The which is kind of where my question is because I had like quite a bit like left over because I have three hatcheries going on all the time just because I'm paranoid about running out because it happened to me while yeah, I was in Vegas and and the and the it's kids didn't to do that and too. feed them like I was like come on now I got home and I had nothing and I'm like stop right now so thank thank god they were old enough to try to eat some you know frozen which they did thank god that got me through at least the 24 hours which isn't ideal because you need at least the 48 and then the 20 you know the next year 12 to enrich them mm -hmm. but now I'm, a, I'm paranoid so I have an excess so I just actually I was reading up on it and I know you can feed them spirulina powder I'm having a hard time finding it locally I know I could probably order it I just haven't thought enough ahead to I, do that I but something, something I read said that you can I checked, yeah I'll have to order some in the meantime I threw the extras in and something I, something I've read said that you could feed them just wheat flour which i know sounds silly but i'm like thinking well if that gets them through 
I don't know if that will work. Obviously, they still need to be enriched before they're fed to anything. I was just curious if anybody had ever heard anything like that mm -hmm. with the wheat flour. I don't, I don't know if that's garbage. And you know. rice bran flour. Uh, some people have fed uh, brewers yeast. A lot of different things, but I get the uh, spirulina powder from brine shrimp direct because it's the cheapest place I can get it. And uh, uh, it's a good product. Um, Last me, um, I don't know, quite a while, even at the rate I use it when I'm feeding the uh, brine shrimp that I grow in 26 gallon containers. Right. But, uh, yeah. Uh, it would be great. In itself is a very good uh, quality product to feed just on its own. But if you okay. mix something else, like uh, I put the Algamac 3050 in it as well, and that gives me the DHA profile. But uh, um, for just feeding, uh, spirulina alone is, is great. All right, I'm going to have to grab some grocery store, Nicole. Nicole. If you go to the grocery store, look where the vitamins are. It's like I a did. health food supplement. I did. I looked, at, even I looked at my local Walmart. I've looked at um, even CVS didn't have any. It was like there was one that was like mixed green, but then it had like beets and everything else mixed in with it. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> so I just didn't bother. You, you guys better. like grocery outlet where you live? A place called uh, grocery outlet? No. Okay. Uh, in Attleboro, there's a, uh, the vitamin shop that would uh, have it, but uh, it's much cheaper to order from Brine Shrimp Direct. Uh, All right, maybe I'll do that. I, okay, perfect. I'll just, I'll now, probably do that. Because I have to order baby bread shrimp eggs soon anyway. Even though I still have like half a thing, I'm just worried. I just want to make sure I always have it. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a finished cellar? I don't. Uh, is it suitable to put things down there? Yeah, actually, my oldest son was just asking us to finish the basement for him. For his birthday, he's going to be 20. He's not leaving anytime soon, so that's well, fine. You know, <laughs> the, clearly, if you try to keep them outside up there in the winter, they're just going to freeze solid. Like my swimming pool up there used to freeze over every winter. Um, yeah. <laughs> but if you could, you know, carve out some space in the cellar, you could probably get away with doing it down there. The only thing is, is uh, if you, you probably already are, but you want to make sure you watch the humidity down there. Yeah, we have a dehumidifier down there. Do you know how, how low of a temperature can they survive at? Because we don't have, like, there's no heating down there or anything. They get you, well, Holly, you just said 30 degrees and they do fine, right? No, I don't know about the Artemia, though. That's the COPA part. But Cindy, okay. actually in the comments, Cindy mentioned that, and I know, I, I, I know many people, you can, you can actually refrigerate Artemia. So where does that come into play, Dan? I'm sorry, what? Refrigerating Artemia. Well, when you refrigerate it, they go dormant. Right. Um, and that's above freezing, and that's not, um, you know, that's somewhere. Yeah, you somewhere... couldn't grow them out. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to grow them out. Um, but if if your cellar is warm enough, just a small heater put in there might be enough to keep it at a temperature where it's viable. Right, thank you. That's awesome. I, you know, my local fish store does sell it. Um, I don't know. There's a place called Lovely Pets. They used to be in Quincy. They're now in Kingston. They're awesome. Privately owned. They, you know, do their due diligence and everything, and they do have a huge thing of artemia, but, uh, no, excuse me, of um, brine shrimp, but I don't know. I just always kind of, if I know where it came from and I know how clean I kept it, I'd probably feel better about it before adding it. it you know, just like treats for the for the adults, you know. Yep. Just curious. So what Only is the for level of temperature here. for them to keep them at? We so, had right. two nights in a row of... Uh, Heavy frost killed off all my tomato plants, and so I don't imagine uh, an outdoor pond for copepods pots and stuff would uh, fare too well. <laughs> I I used to collect uh, plankton year round, and during the summertime it would be many times thicker and many more different species of things I would collect. In the winter months, when we would hit our cold spells, say down to, you know, in the 30s for a day or two, our water temperatures would drop down into the upper 60s and at that point i would have to drag for a much longer period of time to get an adequate amount of copepods now you got to keep in mind that when you're talking about keeping copepods 
you know, at different temperatures, there's copepods from different geographic locations, and some can handle much colder temperatures. You know, there's copepods up north, but if you were to try to go, say, Long Island Sound and, and collect year-round to feed fry like I can do down here, you're probably going to have a tough time. I've talked to guys up there that have tried it, and there are copepods up there, but the, there's just not that many in the winter months. How about the brine shrimp, though? Like, how low of a temperature can you raise them? Like, are they okay at? I suspect once you get somewhere in the, to the 60s, probably the lower 60s, they're going to probably slow down so much that uh, it's going to be tough. Yeah, it takes me about eight weeks uh, when the temperature's down to 62 to 64. Gotcha. About eight yeah. weeks to get them to uh, the adult stage where they're uh, live reproduction. Well, I've noticed that really slows down the hatching because it gets, you know, now lately the weather's been a little cooler here than it was really hot. So now the nights are getting down and they're inside the house, but inside the house, they're getting down to like about, you know, the high 60s and it slowed down my hatch rate. Yep. Yeah, you know, big deal. Big, yeah, temperature is is key with the hatchings. I'm curious, um, it, uh, Cindy made a lot of great comments uh, in the uh, comment section, um, but, oh, and I forgot my camera's off. Ha, hi guys. Okay, so I'm curious, after you have fed, um, enriched, what, okay, let me start the question over. Whether you're feeding your artemia pods, whatever, with the spirulina, just on a regular diet, or you're enriching right before feeding, What's the process for rinsing the live feeds before you feed them? Do you rinse them? I do. I do too. And I've used the, um, you know, before enriching them, I've used the peroxide. I was going to see Dan mention that. And actually, it helped. Like, as soon as I started doing that, my die off with my fry, huge difference. Huge difference. Like, it pretty much stopped. And I only had three left at that point, so I was pretty desperate. But it did make a huge difference not so much with the second batch but yeah oh believe me i keep bugging dan every week when we do in the artemia hatchery video <laughs> come on man we got to tell everybody about peroxide but um it it's coming it's coming and i'm so glad it helped you nicole and if anyone has specific questions about that you can always uh jump in seahorse sources group or message dan himself but we will be covering that on a Wine Wednesday coming extremely soon. Um, bunch of big announcements. Cindy, I, I, I don't know if you've heard from, but I talked to Farm Boy uh, Reef Club um, recently. So we got some things coming up soon with that too. I know Cindy is on that channel constantly. So, and you're doing a great job by the way. Anyway, sorry, got distracted, but okay. So why is it important to rinse them before feeding the live? We already covered frozen. Dan, why do you do it? I do it to rinse off, uh, number one, the the, uh, the culture water that they come out of. Um, a lot of times cultures are are very thick and heavy and there's bacteria within the cultures. Um, if I'm collecting, I'm doing it to, as a prophylactic measure because I'm trying to rinse you know, other things I don't want in the tank off. Um, that's why I do it. Gotcha. Okay, well, since we've been going two hours, guys, anything else that, you know, we wonder about frozen feeds or is there anything we haven't covered? Open, open little five minutes before I call it here. Dan, did, did I miss anything? You covered by the sea. Man, what a good, what a good talk, I think. But, um, yeah. Miss Marina, anything? I know you love when I call on you. Okay. Well, I'm going to, when I get done here, guys, I, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, sorry, I keep um, forgetting to unmute it. <laughs> and then I think I'm, I'm speaking to you when I'm not. I do the same thing. Don't worry. But, well, I, I, I think we had, I think we had a pretty good chat about everything. If you watch this later after we're not live guys, and you have any questions, comments, suggestions, uh, something didn't make sense. All you've got to do is comment. I will see it and we'll get you the answers you need or join us next week and ask the question. No problem. Um, but yeah, I, I think we uh, pretty much covered it and I will link when we're done 
the Tammy video. Um, yeah, I think that's about the size of it. And look, Ray, you stayed with us the whole time. Jish. Well, my dog, uh, I was lucky. I got out with him just before we started here. So uh, I didn't have to leave to take him. Well, we appreciate everything you, you bring every, every single week. Lots of good information from everybody. Thanks to Holly, who's not sitting there right now, but, and Nicole, every, all of you guys, Marina. Um, and yeah. Okay. Well then I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it for the night unless there was, Holly, did you have anything else? Or? No, but I was going to show you okay. um, yeah. a couple weeks back. You asked me about the old seahorse book. Yeah. So there it is. Oh, wait, hang on. I don't have it on you. Hang on. There we go. Okay. Do you see it? Yep. Published in 1961. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anything, so, anything well, different in the there? Book? Oh. Who wrote the Everything's book? Everything's Different by Robert P. L. Strohan. Never heard of him. <laughs> but. Yeah, from All Pets Books Incorporated. I bet that's a good one. <laughs> it's amazing how much has changed. And yeah, thank you for showing us. <laughs> yeah, so they've got seahorses and fish bowls. Well, mostly the dwarves, oh. of course, but they do talk about the bigger ones. Mm. And they talk about, of course, the filters they had was the under gravel filter. <laughs> Jeez. Well, that's why. Yeah, guys, we already made that call. Next week, uh, bring uh, next week. Bring any books that you have, um, and tell us, you know, whether they're good information that should be shared. We're going to discuss, you know, where you can find the right answers because things do change. You know, maybe obviously a lot from that book but that's what we'll be uh, chatting about next week so we hope you all join us um but okay i'm gonna call it for tonight wine glass is almost empty thank you everyone for coming and such a great conversation again give us comments if you know if there's something you don't feel we covered good enough or if you have any questions um all right everybody say bye bye bye, -bye. dance bye. dance disappeared anyways <laughs> marina bye thank you all right. Ha uh, happy Wine Wednesday, everybody. We'll see you next week.